Hello, and welcome to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Christy Taylor in New York. And I'm Sophie Bushwick, also in New York. This week on the podcast, a new high-resolution look at the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Why unexploded weapons from World War II might be getting more dangerous. And how researchers have found new hints of an elusive quantum particle for gravity. Plus, if you're not getting sleep, chances are you feel older than you are, which kind of explains a lot about my experience of life. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) But first, speaking of feeling old, researchers have found a new way to make old mice seem younger. This time, the work targets the immune system. A new therapy allowed mice to fight infections better and to experience less inflammation much like younger mice. Health reporter Grace Wade is here to explain. Hi, Grace. Hi. Of all the ways that researchers might try to make aging animals younger, why would they want to target the immune system? Right. So as we age, our immune systems do as well. And these changes may be due to our blood stem cells, which can develop into any type of cell, including those that play different roles in protecting us from pathogens. But when we get older, the distribution of these stem cells changes. More of them become biased towards becoming some immune cells rather than others. This imbalance makes us less able to fight infection. We also become more prone to chronic inflammation, which accelerates aging across the body and increases the risk of illnesses like heart disease, cancer, and type 2 diabetes. So the immune system really is a logical target for reducing age-related health issues. Got it. So let's look at these mice then. What did the researchers do to rejuvenate their immune systems? It all goes back to those stem cells. Mm -hmm. A research team at Stanford University developed antibodies that can recognize and attack those that are biased while ignoring those that lead to the right mix of immune cells. They then gave the antibodies to six mice that were between 18 and 24 months old, which is comparable to roughly around 56 to 70 years in human terms. Okay, Uh, so they set out to kill the stem cells that were acting old while preserving the ones that were still producing this young mix of immune cells. Did I get that right? Yes, exactly. Great. So what happened? One week later, the mice that were treated had about 38 percent fewer of those biased stem cells compared to mice that weren't given the treatment. Plus, the treated mice had significantly greater amounts of two very important types of white blood cells that are crucial for combating pathogens. And they had lower levels of inflammation. So their immune systems looked distinctly younger than they had before. The team also vaccinated 17 older mice against a mouse virus. Some of them had gotten the rejuvenation treatment eight weeks earlier, while the others hadn't. They then infected the mice with the virus and two weeks later measured the number of infected cells in each mouse, which essentially was just showing them how many of the mice were able to fight off the infection. Only one out of the eight untreated mice had cleared the infection, while four out of the nine treated ones had, meaning the treatment seemed to have helped the mice respond better to both the vaccine and then the infection. All right. So the next question is, of course, the obvious one. Mice are not people. What would it take to try this in people? Right. That's always the bigger question. And it's not yet clear. Humans also see this increase in biased stem cells as they age. So antibody treatment may have a benefit, but we still don't understand potential side effects. One team is concerned that by depleting stem cells, even just the biased ones could cause an increased risk of cancer. On the other hand, a stronger immune system is also better at finding and eliminating cancers. Either way, this treatment is a breakthrough for our understanding of why the immune system declines with age. And it may also have implications for chronic inflammatory diseases. So even the researchers that were cautious about cancer risk are expressing excitement. It's easy to forget, but at the center of our galaxy, there is a lurking monster a black hole millions of times more massive than the sun. It's called Sagittarius A-star, and we had our first glimpse of this monster a couple years ago with help from the Event Horizon Telescope. And now the very same telescope has a brand new picture for us in higher resolution. Now, I'm going to describe this because we are a podcast. So if you look at this new image, what you see is this donut-like ring of various shades of red, orange, and yellow on a dark background with this dark hole at the center indicating the event horizon, which is that place in a black hole where light can't escape. There are also these three extra bright spots around the perimeter, and where the last image was fairly fuzzy and indistinct, this new one has lines. 
And that's that's the feature. Lots and lots of lines swirling around the edge and spiraling into the event horizon. Alex Wilkins is here. And Alex, you're going to tell us about what this picture and all those lines say about the magnetic fields of Sagittarius A star. Am I right? Yes, you are correct. It might not sound exciting to people who aren't astronomers, but yes, magnetic fields, they're really important. It's all well and good imaging a black hole, and we've seen it before, and it's incredible, but magnetic fields are really necessary to understanding how a black hole actually works. The physics of all this gas and matter that it's sucking up and that's swirling around at extreme speeds around the circumference is determined by the magnetic field. One really nice example of this is jets. So some supermassive black holes produce these enormous jets of really high energy matter and energy that can span greater distances than entire galaxies. And astronomers think that the magnetic fields around the black hole's event horizon are responsible for this process. One clue confirming this comes from another much bigger black hole that we have imaged called M87 star. And this has jets and we've seen its magnetic field and we think the two are linked. And we saw this in 2021 with the Event Horizon Telescope. But what we've never seen is jets from Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So you might not expect to see a similar magnetic structure if you were to look there. And you say you might not expect, but as we know, expectations are often surprised in science. What did we actually find? Yep, surprise, they did find a really distinct (laughs) magnetic structure. And what's more, it looks super similar to the one around M87 star, which has astronomers quite excited for a few reasons. First of all, M87 is 1,500 times more massive than Sagittarius A star. So the fact that both have similar looking magnetic fields suggests that there might be something common and universal about how black holes work and their magnetic fields. But even more than that, if there's a magnetic field around Sagittarius A star, then one of two things are true when it comes to jets. Either magnetic fields aren't responsible for jets like we thought they were, or there are jets from Sagittarius A star, but we just can't see them. So the astronomers that I spoke with are really keen to do follow-up observations and find out what's actually going on here. It's pretty cool that the better we get at imaging black holes, the more mysterious they seem to become. And I mean, just observing them in the first place isn't easy, is it? Yeah, and not easy really is an understatement when it comes (laughs) to imaging black holes. Because Sagittarius A star is at the center of our galaxy, stuff like dust, gas, and stars are getting in the way all the time when we try and look at it. And it's also spinning and changing really rapidly. So taking a picture of it is really, really, really hard. The Event Horizon Telescope isn't one telescope, but it's actually a network of eight observatories across Earth, which combined form a sort of massive telescope operating as one thing. And hundreds of astronomers had to coordinate their observations over several days and do loads of really intense statistical analysis to produce the final image. And that's not even mentioning the magnetic field. For that, they also had to measure the polarization of the light, which is how the electric and magnetic fields in the light are oscillating up and down, and which directly lead back to the black hole's magnetic field. And keep in mind, we only just got our first image of any black hole five years ago when they first put out that picture of M87 star, which everyone was obsessed with (laughs) at the time. So to be gaining insights of this kind at all is a really monumental advance for astrophysics. Yeah, I am both tired and excited on behalf of these scientists. But uh, to go back to this jet, does our supermassive black hole make jets or not? And if it does, how could we possibly have missed them? So sadly, I don't think I can give you an answer. I think the jury's still out Mm -hmm. on that. But there are a few pieces of evidence that there might have been jets, at least at some point in the Milky Way's history. So a few years ago, astronomers spotted these enormous spheres of X-ray producing plasma that were above and below the Milky Way, which they called the Fermi bubbles. And they think that these bubbles could have been produced by jets coming out of both sides of the black holes and pushing loads of gas out in this bubble shape. But if they were produced by jets, it's not clear why we're not seeing them and why they would have stopped. But the astronomers think that the magnetic field, which they hope to image in more detail, really holds the key to all of this. Okay, so it's a cosmic mystery. Uh, I can't wait to see what the researchers figure out next from this project. Every week, we bring you some of the most fascinating science and technology news from the real world. But what about the bizarre fictional planets we might see on TV? This week's Culture Lab is all about a fantastical ecosystem on the made-up planet Vesta from the show Scavenger's Rain. Reporter Carmela Padovich callahan talked to biologists about the real science of examining new life and understanding how it works, and how even the weirdest fiction can bring us to a better relationship with science. That's already in your feed. And for more on the escapism front, next week's Escape Pod brings you escape, literally. 
Tune in next Tuesday to learn about the exploding beetles that use chemistry to evade predators and all the work that went into humanity's real-life escape from Earth's gravity. And we've also got the extremely impressive abilities of freedivers, some of whom just want some peace and quiet very far from the surface of the ocean. This uh, episode didn't quite pan out as I thought. You know, it, it's my fault. I had a retching toads and now we've got like <laughs> terrifying depths and, you know, rockets exploding. That's coming Tuesday. One of the many legacies of war is all the unexploded bombs and shells that remain long afterwards. Think of all the bombs countries have boasted about dropping or landmines they've buried, and then the large percentage that never actually detonated. You might think they become less dangerous over time, but in fact, a study has found some can actually become more dangerous. Michael LePage is here. Hello, Michael. Hi. You reported on this study of unexploded bombs. Before we get into the details, can you just explain what is meant by unexploded ordnance, as it's called? Yes, so what we're talking about here are not only the bombs that didn't explode after they were dropped or the shells that failed to explode. We're also talking about the various kind of mines. We're talking about ammunition in ships that sank and ammunition that got buried or dumped at sea to try and get rid of it, or all of that kind of stuff. And how big a problem is this stuff worldwide? Oh, it's a huge problem, really massive problem. So there are just millions of tons of unexploded ordnance all around the world. So even countries like Canada, where no major battles have been fought in recent times, have a problem with it because of all the military training that was done there and because they also dumped old am ammo in sort of on the land sites and, and in the sea. So Canada alone has more than 800 sites where there's unexploded ammunition. And of course, in countries like the UK, unexploded bombs from World War II are still found every year. And they do sometimes go off unexpectedly. Why is it getting more dangerous over time? You know, what have we discovered? So I've been talking to an explosives disposal expert in the Norwegian Defence Force, and he's been cutting open unexploded bombs and shells from the Second World War and testing the explosives inside. Now, two years ago, he tested two of the most common explosives called TNT and PETN, and he found that they were just as explosive as when they were first made. So these bombs are not getting any less dangerous. And now he's done another study and tested another common explosive called Amatol, and this time he found that it's actually becoming more sensitive to impacts, meaning that the bombs and shells containing it could explode if they were dropped. He's not quite sure why this is happening. He's going to do further studies to find out. But it could be because as the chemicals are aging, there are crystals and salts forming inside that are more sensitive to impact. And maybe this is a stupid question that says a lot about my life experience, but <laughs> isn't exploding when they're dropped what bombs are supposed to do? <laughs> You'd think, wouldn't you? Uh, but actually, the explosive in bombs and shells are not normally impact sensitive. So to make them explode, you've got to add a fuse to trigger that explosion. It's when those fuses fail that bombs don't explode on impact. So when people are handling bombs and shells that don't have a fuse attached, they're normally regarded as quite safe to handle. Uh, what this finding shows is that if people are handling or disposing of unfused munitions, they need to be a lot more careful. So the bottom line is that unexploded bombs and shells from the Second World War remain at least as dangerous today as they were then, and some are getting more dangerous? Yes, exactly. And I think the big problem here is that a lot of governments assume the opposite is true, and that they can just leave all this unexploded stuff where it is, and eventually the problem will go away because the explosives will degrade and become harmless. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there's a sunken ship in the Thames Estuary, not that far from London, which contains 1,400 tonnes of high explosives. Now, if that went off all at once, it would cause one of the biggest non-nuclear explosions ever in history. And it's just been left there for 80 years, despite various warnings over the years of the danger it poses and the need to do something about it. And of course, Amatol, that chemical I was talking about, isn't used as much in bombs and shells nowadays, but it is still present in some of the Soviet-era munitions being used in Ukraine at the moment. So this is a problem that's going to get worse in some places. Up next, we turn to an elusive particle that has been spotted for the first time in a small piece of a semiconductor. It's called a graviton. It may offer clues to connecting gravity to quantum physics. And to say anything more sophisticated than that, I really have to turn it over to Carmela Padovich Callahan. Carmela, why is the graviton such an important find, assuming we've actually found it? The shortest answer is that it is the particle that would carry gravity or make up gravitational waves. 
And we care about such a particle, the graviton, because finding one would teach us how gravity works in the quantum universe. We think we live in a quantum universe. And in <laughs> fact, physicists have been trying to figure out how to make gravity quantum for a very long time. But there's so much disagreement on exactly how to do it. We know how to do it for other forces. So for instance, if you think about photons, which are particles of light, we've long known that they're sort of the quantum chunk of an electromagnetic force. Similarly, nuclear forces or the strong nuclear force is carried by gluons, which are another particle that we feel pretty good about. So the graviton would help us do the same for gravity. Got it. So this is a story then about quantum gravity, which is secretly a deep story about the nature of our entire physical reality. <laughs> but it's also a story about just doing an experiment with a material that you can hold in your hand and put in a fridge. So bring the two together for us, Carmela. Yeah, it's it's quite convoluted, but, but maybe a good place to start is sort of to ask, if I gave you a random unknown particle right now, what would you have to learn about it to suspect that I may have given you a graviton? I would ask it, are you a graviton? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so what if you what if you didn't ask it directly? What if you were like, what is your spin, little particle? And the particle said it had spin too. <laughs> now you've got a pretty good clue that it may be a graviton. This is very cute. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and this is kind of what the researchers did in this new experiment that I reported on. It was a little less cute because they like took a chunk of a material and had to put it in a very cold fridge and then hit it with very, very powerful magnetic fields. Fields, so sort of extreme conditions. But in those extreme conditions, the material was really susceptible to quantum effects. And in fact, the electrons in the material were so affected by these quantum effects that they formed a type of uh, sort of odd incompressible fluid. And this fluid could carry excitations. So you can think about, you know, a, a more regular fluid like water, where all the molecules in a pond have to move in concert to make ripples or some other sort of specific shape. In the electron fluid, some of these excitations had the shape that was particle-like. And these excitations were what the researchers focused on. They examined their properties by hitting them with laser light, and they found that these excitations had the same value of spin as a graviton would, so spin two. So this isn't exactly a graviton. I mean, it's not the specific particle you'd detect if you did find a way to look at the quantum structure of space-time. But you're saying in some ways it still fits the graviton criteria? Something like that. So, so theorists are kind of divided on this, but since we have never really seen a spin-2 particles before, and we don't really think there should be other spin-2 particles that are not gravitons, what this new experiment found is as graviton-like as it gets for now. You can sort of think about it as there being a, a mini world of electrons inside of the semiconductor sample in the lab, and in that mini world, this thing that they found is the graviton. But how do we make the leap from that graviton to the one that's more relevant for the bigger world that we actually live in? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge question, but everyone I spoke to for this story and I, I called up three or four different people, they were all really excited about the prospect of figuring this out now that they have something in the lab. So several researchers, including some theorists, pointed out to me that this experiment is a great place for testing bits and pieces of theories of quantum gravity. It's a, a, a benchtop laboratory for approximated theories or theories that have been tweaked to be simpler that we could then later generalize into something that could actually be relevant for sort of full four-dimensional space time that we live in. Even if they wouldn't commit to this new experiment having found the graviton, they were all looking forward to having the option of, of poking and prodding something graviton-like. <laughs> Christy, how well do you sleep at night? Well, I knew we were going to be talking about sleep today, so I purposefully had terrible insomnia last <laughs> night. Um, you are committed to your I craft. I blame the spring birds at 5 a.m. <laughs> uh, it's fine. So I assume there's more bad news about studies telling us that not sleeping is going to kill me. I mean, there are definitely a lot of those, but not exactly this time. Okay. There is new research uh, about how sleep affects how young you feel or your subjective age. And it turns out that a full month of really good sleep can actually make you feel 5.8 years younger, both mentally and physically. And on the other hand, a single bad night of sleep can make you feel almost three months older. Wow. Well, 
I take it the research involved, you know, forcing people not to sleep, maybe poking them with a stick or something. Am it I sure right? did. And I mean, some of those these findings that they, they got out of that are even worse. Mm. So one bad night's sleep aged people a handful of months. But the research team also tested two consecutive bad nights Oof. where participants were only allowed four hours of sleep. And those sleepy people felt, on average, nearly four and a half years older after just two nights. So it seems to add up really quickly. I mean, that sounds right. Two bad nights of sleep and I'd get out the knitting immediately. (laughs) Um, So this is all about subjective age, as you've said. Is there any real effect in our bodies, though, of how old we feel? Like, do I actually want to get more anxious about how much I sleep based on these results? Or should I just enjoy, like, the extra spring in my step? after a good night's sleep? (laughs) I mean, the answer is sort of maybe, sort of maybe not. It's about how old you feel as opposed to how old you are. But on the other hand, your subjective age has been associated with a bunch of health indicators. We know that people who feel younger than their actual age live healthier and longer. And as we've often discussed, good sleep is vital for your actual mental and physical health. And personally, I'd just much rather go through life feeling younger, whether that actually translates into a healthier body or not, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to be heading out, and I'll be right back after a nap. All right. I'll just do the podcast without <laughs> you. That's fine. All right, Sophie, you like horses, right? Well, I'm a short person. I am always a little nervous that a horse will step on me. I guess the answer is horses are fine, but they're no dogs. Okay, that's that's fair. Um, though I say this as someone who used to recite horse facts for fun in middle school. Mm. But for many people, a horse can be a very therapeutic and calming presence um, between sort of the capacity for people to form emotional bonds with them and also their sheer, you know, as you mentioned, size, majesty, beauty, etc. So for those people, there's new research on clinical horse-based therapy programs, which are often used to help patients reduce anxiety, recover from addictions, or just improve, like, balance and motor skills. And the thing I liked about this study, though, is it wasn't really about the people. It was actually asking the horses how that therapy was working for them. Uh, That's good. Yeah. At last. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it turns out being a therapy horse can be a little stressful with people petting you all the time. Oof. I can imagine. Strange people, all those hands. Exactly. And horses are prey animals. So while therapy programs do select horses that are notably calm and tolerant and robust, they can still display signs of stress when they're just tied to a fence and kind of offered up to patients for petting. So a research team at the University of Guelph in Canada investigated whether allowing horses to consent to contact would improve their stress. So they took a group of 10 experienced therapy horses, and they observed half of them tied loosely to a fence. This was the non-consensual setup. And the other half involved a closed pen where the horse had enough space to walk away from the person that might be touching them. The person was told to only pet the horse if it was within arm's length. So the horse could opt in or out of being touched just by walking away again. Consent. I'm in favor of that. But were the horses... Well, it turns out horses are just like us. They like consent. (laughs) And the horses with the option to walk around spend about half their time out of reach of the humans. And the research team also watched these horses for signs of stress, such as yawning or licking their lips, uh, restlessly shifting their feet or swishing their tails, for example. And the horses that were tied up and unable to opt out of being touched did a lot more of all of those things. So twice as much yawning or lip licking, 40% more foot shifting, and about 10% more tail swishing. Aw. So we're all nervous. Yeah. Aw. Okay. One last one for you from the Chronicles of Robots for Very Specific Tasks. Which is at this time, does this robot do my laundry, fold my socks? Because I don't even fold my socks, Sophie. (laughs) You are out of luck there, but this bot can fold something way more fun than socks. Researchers at Columbia University made a robot that can design, build, and test paper airplanes. (laughs) They're calling it PaperBot, and it's better than humans given the same materials and number of attempts. It feels like there are no real problems in the world that robots could solve. Why paper airplanes? In the team's defense, the paper airplanes are a vehicle for teaching skills that might have more practical uses. Basically, many labs are employing robots to design and test new materials. This is much faster than using humans. And in some cases, the robots just rely on computer simulations to cut down on real-world testing. But there are a lot of materials that are just really difficult or computationally expensive to simulate. Think fluids or materials that deform. 
Like paper. Like paper. So PaperBot <laughs> is actually optimized to test a variety of tools made from folded paper with real-world testing as a way to understand more realistic circumstances that would be hard to simulate virtually. And PaperBot hasn't just made paper planes. It's also making these little gripping tools using kirigami, the Japanese art of paper cutting. And those paper grippers could produce nearly a newton of force. So that's flimsy paper lifting the equivalent of about four strawberries. Mm. So all in all, this might lay the groundwork for more realistic robotic testing of other kinds of materials down the road. All right. Very well. You have sold me. I am on Team PaperBot now. Team PaperBot. Yes. And with that, that's all for this week. Thank you for listening. You can find all the stories we talked about today in the show notes. And you can subscribe to this podcast on whichever app you're listening on. Plus, if you like the great stories we're bringing you, please give us a rating or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Share your favorite stories, tell your nerdy friends, or just make a paper airplane and throw it through (laughs) a window. I don't know. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Goodbye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk. 